morning. As we come together to worship our Lord and Savior, we're reminded of the words we have in both the book of Romans and the book of Acts. We're reminded, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And in the book of Acts, we're reminded that there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given by which we must be saved. And so as we come together this day, that is our purpose, to worship our Lord and Savior, in whom are the words of life and salvation. So let's come together in excitement. I invite you, if you're willing and able, let's take a moment and welcome one another to worship today.
sisters and brothers in Christ, we are so thankful for who our Lord and Savior and friend Jesus is. He's conquered sin. He's triumphed over death. We can sing that he indeed is the king of glory. But we also proclaim in our lives through our words and deeds that he is the head of the body, the cornerstone, which means he is our main foundation. Let us welcome Jesus every day as the cornerstone of our lives and let us join and sing Christ alone, cornerstone.
Lord, Heavenly Father, we come together this day with thankful hearts, thankful for your work in our lives, thankful for the work of Christ in bringing about salvation, that we as people who fall short, people who do things that, that are not according to your will, know that you are full of grace and forgiveness, and that you have blessed us through the work of Christ. May he be our cornerstone. May he be the foundation on which we stand both in times of great joy and through the storms and struggles of life. For it is only through Christ that we can stand faultless before you. This grace, this forgiveness and salvation can be found nowhere else. Oh Lord, Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit upon us now. Center our hearts upon you in worship and praise. Send that same spirit on us each day to make it a day that we live for you, for you are worthy. In your holy and blessed name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Just a, a couple quick announcements or updates to the announcements in your bulletin. There's mention of informational meeting for the ministry oversight teams. Uh, we're going to be having those meetings to talk about some of the realignment in the ministry teams and those that are willing to get involved. Uh, we're going to have those meetings, but we're going to push them back. And so they're going to be at least on the August 11th or later. We're going to confirm that date for you for next week. But those meetings will be happening. Please prayerfully consider if you're willing to be on a part of that ministry. Uh, but though we're going to have to push those meetings back. Also, there was a campo that was scheduled for Adrian coming up. That is going to be canceled. Uh, just some weather factors and other concerns. It's going to be easier to, to look at that next year. And so the group organized and decided it would be easier to, to start fresh next year. Uh, Adrian is that campground that they traditionally go to, the one that did have all that flooding here not too long ago. I do want to remind you today that we do have our connection cards. So if you are looking for more information to get connected, um, maybe be involved in the prayer chain and other information from church. Uh, these cards are in your pews to help and get connected. We also welcome those of, us, those of you that are joining online this day. Here in a moment, we have an opportunity to send our little ones, uh, three years old through fifth grade, for what we call children's church. It's a time for them to go and have their time of service, to, to study together, to pray together. And to be able to ask questions and continue maturing in faith. And, and as we turn to God's word and, and we bless their time, let's turn to the Lord in prayer once again. Heavenly Father, we come to you again asking for your blessing. We ask your blessing on our little ones as they go and, and have their time of study and learning. That as they have a lesson that they can digest and ask questions about. That that would be exactly what happened. That your word would work not just on their minds but on their hearts for them to come and love and serve you, O oh Lord. We ask that same blessing on those of us who remain in here as we, we turn to your your word has returned to this letter to the Colossians and, and what it speaks into our lives, talking about who Jesus is and, and help us to understand through your spirit to what that means for us and how we are to live. Thank you for giving us your word that we have truth in a world full of, of gray area. We don't have to wonder with you. Thank you for this clarity. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, Children's Church, you are dismissed through the back entrance. As they make their exit, I, I do want to draw your attention to the bulletin this morning. If you look on the insert in your bulletin, there is a spot for taking notes if you choose to fill those in as we go. And so this morning we are continuing our series. The series is titled In Christ Alone. And in, in this we are studying the letter to the Colossians, which is a letter to the church in Colossae. And in this letter, Paul and Timothy are writing to the Colossian believers and they, who are struggling through a time period where they're hearing teachings that we would call 
heretical. Teachings that were counter what Jesus had taught. The teachings that were trying to change or add to the requirements of what it means to be reconciled, to be on right standing with God. Now, last Sunday, we, we looked at the beginning section of this letter, which included uh, some greeting, uh, some thanksgiving, and also a prayer for the Colossians. And so now, as is seen in many of Paul's letters, he speaks to matters of doctrine, matters of theology and understanding, and here a lot of high Christology, which is theology about Christ and and learning specifically about him. We see this all laid out as a matter of, of not just teaching, not just of knowing doctrine, but a matter of knowing doctrine and theology that will speak to the issue that the Colossians are dealing with. So in verses 15 through 20 in this first chapter of Colossians, Paul lays out what we call the preeminence of Christ. Now preeminence is a word that I don't use in my daily vocabulary. I'm guessing most of us do not either. But when we're talking about this idea of preeminence or the preeminence of Christ, this is, ta- this is a reference to how Christ is superior in all things, that there is nothing greater than him. And, and this is a matter of doctrine which speaks directly into this issue or the issues the Colossians are dealing with. Because the false teachers who are are wanting to add requirements to reconcile our relationship with God and this doctrine that they are spreading that is not from Christ but is bringing in elements of the Old Testament that are not requirements of reconciliation. Because we know Jesus is our means of reconciliation with God, of being on right standing with him. And so to add new requirements outside of what Jesus has said is a challenge to the preeminence of Christ. And so for the, the teaching of Scripture that we find repeated over and over again is that Jesus is enough. His works in creation and redemption are perfect. And to insist that something more is needed is to make a claim that the redemptive work of Jesus' death and resurrection are in some way lacking. While the issues in Colossae are, are not directly approached until later in this letter, Paul is already laying the theological groundwork for this discussion. And so if you have your Bibles open this morning, I invite you to to open with us as we turn to the first chapter of Colossians. And we really study one of the the most well-known sections of this letter. Uh, We're going to start with just the, the first part here of verse 15. For it's written, He is the image of the invisible God. Now, when it comes to the Trinity and the deity of Christ, it is verses such as these that help to guide our understanding. As Paul expresses throughout several of his letters, Jesus is God. And this informs our understanding as Jesus has the Son, the second person of the Trinity who has taken on flesh. Which is why Jesus is known as the image of the invisible God. And so if you're following along in your notes this morning, our first point is that in Jesus, our God who is otherwise invisible, is revealed. Our otherwise invisible God is revealed. By nature, God is invisible. If you have sight then you can see others around you, yet God is different than his creation. While people are made in the image of God, and we can reflect some of the attributes of God, 
And we can see evidence for God's handiwork in the world all around us. You cannot look at something and say, that is God. That is with the exception, the lone exception of Jesus Christ. Because again, Jesus is God. And in taking on flesh and living amongst his creation, Jesus revealed to humanity our otherwise invisible God. This is not the only thing, however, that Paul has to say about Jesus. For he is also described in in the second part of verse 15 as the firstborn of all creation. Now, this passage is one of those that can give people trouble over the years. And, And what that really boils down to is what is meant by this term firstborn. Groups such as Jehovah's Witnesses, they have over time falsely claimed that this points to Jesus being part of the created order. That he was the first and greatest of God's creation. But their belief that Jesus is among the created order is undeniably false by the repeated teaching of the Bible. The teaching of Scripture is consistent. Not only was the eternal Son of God not created, but he was the very agent of creation. And so Paul, along with Timothy, described Jesus as the firstborn of all creation. But then our challenge as readers of the word is to explore what is meant By that term, firstborn, keep in mind the culture and use a terminology in that age, in the time that it was written. How would the the believers in Colossae understand this term? Because that term, firstborn, it could mean a couple of different things. And when you struggle to understand how a word is being used in the Bible... And maybe even the context of its use can be a little unclear or foggy. One of the best bets is to search on how that word is used throughout Scripture. In this case, we have scriptural examples that can help clarify similar uses of this term firstborn. And so while the Old Testament is in Hebrew instead of the Greek of the New Testament... We are helped here by the psalmist that speaks of King David being the firstborn. This is Psalm 89. We're going to jump to verse 27. It says, And I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. That's speaking of King David. Now this is a really strong indicator for us that there is more to this term firstborn than birth order. Because you might remember, King David famously was not the firstborn in his family, was he? Not only was he not the oldest of his brothers, he was the youngest. Yet Psalm 89 speaks of him being made to be the firstborn. And then helpfully goes on to clarify this this meaning of the highest of the kings of the earth. Now, in the Old Testament... Firstborn, or the firstborn son in their society, was more than just the first one to be born. He was also the main heir of the family estate. And so when Psalm 89 speaks of of David, or King David, becoming the firstborn, and Colossians speaks of Jesus becoming the firstborn of creation, these are done so figuratively. Not speaking of birth order, For David was not the youngest of his brothers, and Jesus was not part of the created order. Instead, what these terms describe is a matter of authority. Just as in the Old Testament family system, the firstborn son was given the authority which comes with being the primary heir. And David was lifted to be the highest of the kings of the earth. We see that Jesus has the figurative firstborn of creation has supremacy. He has authority over all of the created order. Which brings us to the second point in our notes this morning, which is that firstborn describes Jesus' supremacy 
over creation. We're talking about Jesus' supremacy over creation. Now this absolute authority over creation was demonstrated during Jesus' life. We find scripture accounts of how he calmed a raging storm, how he walked on the water, that he healed sick from all kinds of ailments, including ones that had no cure, and performed all kinds of other miracles. And while all these miracles demonstrate the deity of Christ, they also show for us the authority that he has over creation. And this all speaks to that that big word that we mentioned earlier, preeminence. The preeminence of Christ, that he is superior in all things. This preeminence is seen in Jesus' supremacy over creation as the figurative firstborn over creation. And that is not the only way that creation points to the supremacy of Christ. For Paul goes on to describe Jesus' role in creation. As we pick up in verse 16, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Notice how verse 17, as we get it up there on the screen for you, notice how verse 17 clarifies that Christ is before all things. Again, another indicator that the Son is not created, and that this figurative understanding of the term firstborn is the correct usage. And and while that is helpful, that is not the focus of these two verses. What verses 16 and 17 lay out for us is again that preeminence of Christ that is seen both in his work as the agent of creation, that is through Christ that, that creation happened, and also has the sustainer of creation, that Christ continues to sustain us even the day. So verse 16 details how Jesus is exalted over all of creation. All things were created by Christ and for Christ. This is his role as what we call the agent of creation. That he had an active role in creating all there is. And not only was everything created by Christ, but it was created for him. And furthermore, Jesus is called that sustainer of creation. For as Paul writes, in him all things are held or hold together. This is that term that we sometimes hear, the providence of God. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that term. But we're talking about God's work of upholding creation. For we were not created and then just left on this earth to fend for ourselves. The universe does not exist on some kind of autopilot setting. God continues to actively care for his creation, to care for us. And so Jesus is our sustainer. And we are told that all things are held together through him. Now in in these last few verses, what Paul has done is laid out an argument for this preeminence of Christ based upon creation. That we can look at the created order and see the authority Christ has, how he is supreme in all things. But then in the following verses, there is a pivot, a pivot to focus on Jesus' preeminence as it is displayed through the church. See this starting in verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. As Christians, we are often described as the body of Christ. And if that is the case, then Jesus is the head of the body. He is the only king and head of the church, which is not a conflict with the authority of the Father or the Holy Spirit. For this authority, this distinction as head of the church was given to Jesus by the Father. 
And so Jesus as head of the church is not a man-made idea. This is just a matter of God's design. And so the supremacy of Christ is seen not only in his authority over creation and over the church, but also in him being the firstborn of the dead. Again, we return to that term firstborn. And just as we saw in the previous use of the word, you know, there's some requirement of using scripture to understand what this means. So for the term firstborn of the dead... This does not mean that Jesus was the first to die. We know who the first person to die in Scripture was. Abel, right? At the hand of his brother Cain. So Jesus was the firstborn of the dead is a reference not to, not to order, but to his resurrection. And the new age and the new creation that was established through Christ. For in the resurrection, Jesus did more than just rise from the grave, never to die again. What we find then is the third point in our notes this morning is that Jesus' resurrection, it does something important, Jesus' resurrection guarantees ours. That Jesus' resurrection guarantees ours. Now this, of course, needs some clarification because this assurance is not universal For all those who are among God's people, God's elect, you could call them, those whose faith is in Christ for salvation will one day be raised in a resurrection like his. And while the work of Jesus in salvation is sufficient for mankind, meaning that it is not lacking in any way, we know that it is only effective for those whose faith is in him for salvation. And so Jesus rose from the grave. In doing so, he conquered sin and death. Something done for us. All who believe and will one day follow suit. And we can be certain of this promise. Because Jesus' own resurrection is the proof. It is the guarantee that God will keep his promise to one day raise his faithful as well. This promise was so fundamental to the purpose of the resurrection that in one of his other letters, in his letter to the Corinthians, his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul wrote this. He said, But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. It's a strong statement. What we see in it is that for Paul, these two events... Jesus' resurrection and the coming resurrection of the dead are so closely linked that to deny the resurrection of the dead is also a denial of Christ and his resurrection. Because this is the reason that Jesus died and rose again. So that one day we who follow and believe in him would one day be resurrected to a resurrection like his. And so to deny this resurrection of the dead is to deny the very purpose of Jesus' death and resurrection. And so again, in all things, Jesus is shown to be preeminent. He is above all. He has supreme authority over creation and the church, which is again stated in verses 19 and 20. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Now we should keep in mind the struggle the Colossians had, that the struggle they were living through against the spread of teachings that were trying to add requirements to salvation beyond what Jesus had taught. These verses truly lay, again, that theological groundwork of the teachings that will follow in this letter. For if Jesus is God, with the fullness of God, please to dwell in him. And it is through him and his blood shed on the cross that all things are reconciled to God. 
Then how could these false teachers, these individuals in Colossae who are trying to claim that that's not enough, that you need these actions partnered with that, or how could anyone else in their time period or today lay claim that something additional is needed beyond Christ? Because Paul has taken us, and, and the Colossians who received this letter, on kind of a deep dive theologically. These are not the easiest verses of Scripture to go through and to understand because of the way that Paul wrote these. Almost in an order following that of more of a hymn than a typical letter in, in how he lays out these sentences. But I believe this was done with a purpose. That what Paul has laid out for us are the reasons why Jesus is preeminent. That he is superior in all matters of creation and the church. And what we can take from this is the same point that Paul was trying to get across to the believers in Colossae. Which is the final point in your notes this morning. That there is nothing, and I mean nothing, that needs to be added to what Jesus has done. There's nothing that needs to be added to what Jesus has done. And that's what this is about. This idea that Jesus is enough. All authority has been given to him. And so to deny the teachings of Christ in favor of some kinds of some kind of works based salvation model where you have to do A, B, and C in order to be saved, or if you don't do this one thing, you cannot be amongst God's people. Those kind of ideas are absolute foolishness compared to what Jesus has said. Because he has the authority, and his teaching is clear. The testimony of all God's word is consistent. Salvation comes not from ourselves, not from our actions or works, nor does it come from an adherence to certain rules or traditions. There is no checklist to salvation. Because salvation comes from Christ alone. And it is in Jesus, in Christ alone, that our hope is found. At least it should be. Because that's what we are called into. For once you start adding things to the gospel, once you start making salvation about your actions instead of God's sovereignty over salvation, and once you start believing that grace comes from being a good and loving person, instead of the truth that none are deserving of grace, yet God loves us so much that he gives it freely. Once you start listening to the world, a world that has tuned out the word of God. You start falling for lies. You start trusting. You stop trusting Christ for salvation. And instead put yourself in his place. But as Paul so eloquently explains. Jesus has supreme authority over all of creation. And all matters related to the church and his people. And so when it comes to the means of salvation, all we need to remember is this, that Jesus is enough. You don't need to doubt what your eternity is. If your faith is in Christ, you don't need to doubt whether you're good enough to be amongst God's people. You don't need to doubt whether his blood is enough to cover your sins or your past. Because it is clear, Jesus is enough. Period. End of sentence. Nothing more is needed. And so with grateful hearts for the grace that has been given, let us turn to our Lord in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for this teaching, this reminder to the Colossians that Jesus is enough. And we are grateful for that very fact 
That despite our own shortcomings, despite the ways that, that we wander astray and we go against you, despite our desire to follow you, and there's times where there's a conflict in our own hearts. And we do things we don't want to. That we choose sin over you, yet you welcome us back. And the grace of Jesus is enough. Oh Lord, you are so good to us. Your grace reigns upon us day after day. Your spirit is there to guide us, to uplift us, to help us to make it through and be a comfort in challenging times. We have your word to help us know you more. You provided for us beyond what we deserve. Thank you, oh God. We come to you now as a a broken people. People who are reminded of our need for you. And we lift up in this time our nation. We think of the events yesterday, this attempted assassination of a political candidate. And it's a a reminder of the sinfulness of people, the depravity of people, and the divide that we have. And so anytime there's a divide such as this, anytime that there is such an event, we have concern over what may follow. Will we see the best of humanity come forth where people reject violence or will we see the worst? We ask that you'd send your spirit and bring out the best in people. Help us to be a care and comfort for one another. And people be reminded that even though there's differences across the board, we are a people of peace. We also come to you, O Lord, in this time with very grateful hearts. We're glad to see a return of of those coming from this mission trip that they were able to go and help the Amaros in their ministry down in Mexico for a week and and that they have returned safely. And we look forward here in a couple weeks when they are going to share about their experience. Thank you for the opportunity they were given, the blessing they could be to those that they served and the blessing they have in being able to serve. And we hope that, that that feeling, that growth would continue in them and be an inspiration as we hear and speak with them about what they've been doing for your kingdom. We think of the weather and uh, the need the farmers still have for some hot and dry days, that their, their crops could catch up to this, this setback they had with all the rain at the beginning of this growing season. We put these things in your hands, for there's nothing we can do But Lord, you are able. We especially lift up to those now that are in times of needing healing and recovery. We think of of Don Kuiper and and his knee procedure, and we're glad that went well. And the same blessing on, on Beth as she recovers from that same replacement procedure. We ask that you'd bless each of them with continued recovery, that they would not have much pain as they go through that healing process. We rejoice with Marlene and her family as she recovers from surgery and that everything went well and there's positive results and it's showing as non-cancers as far as they know and what a blessing that is for them. We ask that you continue to be with them, especially Marlene in this recovery process as she makes her way home and goes through those steps of healing. We think of Roxanne as she prepares for that, that surgery on her shoulder tomorrow. We ask... Your blessing upon the doctors, the nurses, those involved, that they would be able to have successful surgery to fix that break, and that you would help her in the meantime today be free from pain, and that healing may come quickly and as painlessly as possible following that surgery. Please, Lord, also be with Zachary as he works through his physical therapy out in Colorado. Give him strength each day to make a little more progress and be encouraged on that pathway to healing. We especially think of those in this time who are fighting cancer. We think of of Phyllis and the journey that she has been on for for Jaime and for Pastor Irwin and for Randy and for Scott and and Roxanne. Lord, be with them and also be with those who are, are not on this list but are going through that journey right now or maybe they've gotten some news that they fear they might be headed down that journey. 
Be with them. Offer healing, both in their body, but also in their spirit as well, that they would be encouraged emotionally and spiritually for what they are facing or what lies ahead. We also think of those who are unable to worship with us regularly. Please be with them. May they feel connected with us as we come and worship together and we pray the prayer that you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so as our our praise team singers make their way forward, I just have a couple challenges for us. Our challenge throughout this series of Colossians was to to read through during the time we're studying this book on our own this letter to the Colossians. And I encourage you in this, that as we go through this letter, that, that we don't just depend upon our own time here studying the word, but you don't take my word for it. Study it for yourself. Go back and reread what we have studied together and see how God speaks to you through it. And I think in light of what happened yesterday, I think it's fair to challenge all of us to be in prayer for our country. Because whenever there's a shooting on a a stage like this, again, what happens is it has potential to bring out either the best or the worst in people. And so we pray that the worst in people will not be seen from this. But as we put our trust in God, let us do this not just through prayer and study, but also through singing his praises. So I invite, if you're willing and able, or if you want to sit however you want to, come with us and sing together, Jesus paid it all. Next Sunday, I will not be here. I'll be at a family reunion connecting with uh, various relatives. Uh, We're going to have here Pastor Erwin Van Leeuwen. I hope I said that right. Uh, Waylon, sorry. Waylon. But he will be here. Um, Many of you know who he is. He was pastor here for 20 years. 
and served a long time. If you're newer like I am, I do not know him. But there will be a chance after that service to have a potluck and fellowship with him in the chapel area, the fellowship area outside of service. Um, I just want to remind though, however, that there is a quiche congregation that uses that space in the afternoon. And so while we encourage that fellowship, we're going to try to clean that up around 12.15 so they can start setting up at 12.30 for their 1 o'clock service. But as we go out this week, as we are reminded of the love of Christ and that he is enough for us, I ask that just as they in the Old Testament days would lay hands on one another for blessings, that you would raise your palms to receive this morning's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.